Chapter 22 takes a look at imperialism and colonialism from 1870 to 1914, which puts us to the eve of uh, the First World War. Imperialism and colonialism are two terms that are interchangeable. The quest for empire, the quest for colonies, those are interchangeable terms. This is sometimes called the new imperialism. The first imperialism was the imperialism of uh, the, uh, the Spanish and the Portuguese uh, as they moved into the new world. Well, this is a second wave of imperialism that's going to carry us into other parts of the world, most notably Africa, the Far East, and uh, even into uh, Southwest Asia and uh, the Middle East. So uh, this is a new uh, type of imperialism. One of the first things that the textbook is going to take a look at after you look through this introductory material and look at the core objectives here, we're going to scroll on down. And uh, the first really part of uh, the chapter talks about what imperialism is. Okay, and you can watch the video to make sure that you uh, understand what imperialism is. There's really a couple of different kinds of imperialism. Formal imperialism is really where a country uh, takes over another country and uh, puts it under its control okay and that can be direct rule or um, indirect rule okay sometimes it's informal imperialism which is where you use behind the scenes uh, informal pressure or uh, economics to uh, gain control of a country so uh, both of those are uh, types that you'll see used during this wave of new imperialism the uh, really one of the the first things you kind of have to kind of delve into here is this new imperialism and its causes and at uh, the beginning here you talk about really a couple of different people uh j a. hobson from england uh, vladimir lenin uh, who of course will go on later on to become uh, the leader of the soviet union once the uh, the uh, bolshevik revolution takes place in russia so they have different opinions about what imperialism is. But historians talk about what caused this wave of imperialism. So there's a couple of different ideas here, and you need to reach, kind of read through those. Markets, economies, uh, nationalism, uh, racism, uh, okay, all are, uh, and even religion, all are, will play a role in this wave of uh, new imperialism. So make sure you take a look at all of uh, these causes. If you look at the map here, these are some of the areas that we're going to take a look at. Okay, Africa right here will be a major source of new imperialism. China will be a major source of new imperialism in a totally different way. India is one of the first ones that the chapter talks about. And even later on, we'll talk a little bit about Southeast Asia, about some of the areas over here even where the United States gets involved. So there are a couple of different places here that you, uh, you're you going to see uh, imperialism take shape. Okay, And by the way, when you're talking about some of these things, make sure you go and read uh, Rudyard Kipling's White Man's Burden here. And uh, it gives you a good idea about some of the viewpoints of uh, racism or how racism and some of these viewpoints start to cross into uh, this new imperialism. The text talks about examples, and uh, one of the first examples is uh, imperialism in essentially in India. One of the real sort of, uh, I guess, powers behind this is the British East India Company, which was so powerful. It had its own military. It has its own uh, really uh, economic system. It controlled monopolies that during the American Revolution, for example, the British East India Company was the only company that could bring tea to uh, the, uh, the United States. But one of the most lucratives is its trade over, of all things, opium. And yes, we're talking about the, uh, the drug, opium. The British had taken control of some very profitable areas, including the poppy fields uh, in North India, and uh, they would begin to use opium as an export and uh, use it to uh, to export to other nations as well. So uh, one of the most important things that happens in England is this section right here, the mutiny. Okay, the Sepoy Mutiny, uh, the Great Mutiny of 1857, uh, right, is a mutiny where uh, the 
the the native Indians will rise up against the British East India Company, all because of uh, the the British East India Company and the British forcing them uh, to use a new type of rifle that had uh, <clears throat> greased cartridges that were greased in uh, animal fat, which was unacceptable to Hindus or Muslims. And uh, so this produced a, a rebellion that the British will eventually have to put down. The fighting is intense. It is, uh, it's really harsh. It's bloody. And uh, it really will put the British finally in control directly of uh, over India. Not indirectly through the British East India Company, but directly. Britain is going to essentially make India a part of the British Empire and will govern it directly. So uh, Lord Curzon becomes the Viceroy of India who uh, will uh, turn India into a, a really almost a state governed over by, uh, by England. Uh, this has tremendous benefits for the British. They uh, will uh, it's a it's a huge market for them. It provides tons of raw materials, and uh, it's a I mean it's a wonderful addition to the British Empire after having lost the American colonies after the American Revolution. the uh, The next big uh, sort of part of uh, the uh, the text after uh, talking taking a look at India, you move to China. And once again, opium is going to play a role in imperialism in China. The Chinese are going to be, uh, they're never, China is too big to be taken over directly by any one country. So instead, what you're going to see is a lot of European countries carving out what many texts call spheres of influence. Places inside of India, or sorry, places inside of China where uh, they dominate the local markets and they dominate trade. The British are the first to really do this because of the opium trade. The British, it's one of the few commodities that the British could successfully market in China. The, uh, the Chinese, as you can imagine, the Chinese government does not want its entire population becoming addicted to opium. And so they will uh, try to limit it and it results in a war between the British and uh, the, uh, the Chinese government at that time which was uh, a, uh, it's still an imperial uh, government ruled over by an empire. So uh, the Chinese government bans it, the British don't like that, and you end up going to war. The, uh, the Manchu government, the, uh, the government that's in place in, uh, in China at that time, does terribly in the war. And one of the most important consequences is uh, that the, uh, the Chinese government will have to sign the Treaty of Nanking, this treaty right here, which gives the British trading privileges, the right to reside in five major cities, gives Britain the port of Hong Kong in perpetuity. The British give it back in the year 2000. Okay, so it remains uh, a British province essentially from 1842 into the year 2000. The uh, British will get even more privileges, and uh, in the aftermath of this, other nations will. Uh, move in and say, look, if you don't give us the same thing, then we're going to bomb you just like the British did. And so uh, these European nations will uh, crowd into China and carve out spheres of influence where they gain access to the Chinese markets, they gain access to the Chinese cities, and it really weakens uh, the Chinese government. As a result, you're going to see several attempts to do away with the uh, the, the Chinese government from inside of China. There's a major rebellion in uh, the, uh, the 1850s, last into the middle of the 1860s, called the Taiping Rebellion. Huge, bloody rebellion that we estimate may have uh, killed as many as 20 million people. So the Opium Wars will uh, lead to this huge rebellion in China that is unsuccessful, the Manchu government stays in place. As you get to about 1900, you get the Boxer Rebellion, which does, it's a really, it's an anti-foreign rebellion, it's an anti-foreigner rebellion. They, the European great powers will uh, 
basically send in forces to help the Chinese government put down the Boxer Rebellion because they want to keep their treaties intact. The, uh, the Chinese really have a very difficult time dealing with this, okay, as you'll find out when you read this part. The, uh, the Russians also are busy. You'll read about the Russo-Japanese War, where it does not go very well for, uh, for Russia. So there is some Russian expansion, but not much. The French, they're also involved out here. Okay, one of the, uh, they'll involve, the French will move into uh, North Africa. They will also, if you kind of look into uh, this part here, okay, they will uh, be doing various things in various places. Uh, so uh, they will move into places like in Southeast Asia and others. The uh, the last, well, it's not the last, I'm sorry, but the other big area that you see uh, the, uh, the Europeans involve themselves in is in Africa. This is so amazing. The, uh, in 1875, if you went to Africa in 1875, it was largely uh, void of any European influence. Only 11% of the continent was in European hands. By 1902, okay, 27 years later, 90% of Africa was under the control of European powers. The, uh, the Europeans will uh, push into Africa, begin to gain territory there, and uh, it becomes a scramble for Africa. The, uh, the biggest, really the, 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 the first sort of venture into Africa under, the, uh, this new, under these new rules was made by the, uh, the, the Belgians. The Belgium is a tiny little country on uh, the border between uh, France and the Netherlands. Belgium is a small little country, but yet it's going to carve out a major empire in Africa that it then uh, will rule over uh, very harshly. The Congo Free State was run by uh, a company run by the, the Belgian king, and uh, it abused uh, the Africa, the, the Africans. It was, uh, it was a horrible situation. The... Uh, Excuse me, if you ever read Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, that is based on the treatment of the Africans during uh, this time period. Once the, uh, the Belgians begin to carve up Africa, other nations are going to move in and partition off Africa for themselves. Germany moves in, Great Britain moves in, France moves in, uh, okay, and uh, the, uh, even the Dutch will move in. And uh, you'll learn about Cecil Rhodes here, and uh, you'll learn about the, uh, as you move into this area right down here, about Cape Colony and the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Okay. That area becomes a major gold producing area and a major diamond producing area and encourages uh, the, uh, the British to uh, move in and take control, and it prompts a war later on. The... Uh, as you get into the text, okay, the uh, the next thing talks about really uh, European culture in uh, the uh, the uh, during this time period. And one of the biggest things that is always associated with imperialism is racism. So make sure that you read uh, this part that I have uh, highlighted, okay, and uh, how racial thinking, racial inferiority begins to be discussed, and of course later on it will become a major belief of uh, Hitler and the Nazis later on, who believe they are a superior people to other, and that's racism. So uh, make sure that you read that part, and it, some of this leads to some opposition. There's opposition here in America to imperialism, led by Mark Twain, of all people. Mark Twain was a major anti-imperialist, okay, but there was, was anti-imperialism from uh, the uh, from all over the world, and uh, some of the uh, some of the people that were involved in it, like I said, included uh, Mark Twain, W. B. Du Bois here. So all of those are involved in uh, the uh, the anti imperial league. the uh, The next sort of thing you'll see that European imperialism moves its way into the Muslim world. So uh, it moves into Southwest Asia and other places like that, and the Europeans will move into those areas, so make sure you read about that. 
Muhammad Ali, the career of Muhammad Ali is a good example. And that's not the boxer Muhammad Ali. Okay, it's a Muhammad Ali is an Ottoman general who uh, will be pivotal in this. Okay, returning into uh, making Egypt a uh, major power, trying to make Egypt a major power. There are some uh, incidents, okay, and uh, imperialism across the world uh, leads to major conflicts sometimes, all right? So I've got a few highlighted here, and these are some of the major conflicts that will uh, happen, imperial conflicts that will happen before the First World War. Fashoda is one, uh, okay, uh, the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, and the Boer War in uh, South Africa as the British move in and try to take control of uh, some of those areas held by the Dutch Afrikaners. It leads to a war in a very bloody and very vicious war. The, uh, it is a, uh, it is, it's a wake-up call for the British. Some people argue that had the British not done so poorly in this war, they do win, but had they not done so poorly in this war, they may not have been prepared for the First World War. We are involved in imperialism as well. This is a, we are a major player in uh, the imperial world too. We uh, wanted to make sure that we kept the open door open in China so that we can continue to trade in China. We uh, go to war with the Spanish over uh, Cuba. The, uh, and so we will defeat the Spanish in the Spanish-American War. We will begin to annex territories after uh, the uh, Spanish-American War, we will govern over Cuba. We will uh, wage a, a major war in the Philippines to put down Philippine rebels. We will uh, take and intervene in Panama, which allows Panama to uh, gain its independence from Colombia, which we then will sign a treaty with Panama so that we can uh, dig the Panama Canal. So... Uh, there are we're involved in this as well and uh, it's a major part of uh, american history if you take american history during this period of time the chapter finishes up talking about some ecological changes that are a result of imperialism how good, it's like the columbian exchange all over again how animals plants and humans move because of uh, the uh, what's going on in imperialism and uh, then you get to the conclusion this is a really important chapter. It sets us up for several things, but really imperialism is a, a major part of uh, this movement. And you think about, we've talked about so many isms up to this point. You've learned about nationalism, socialism, Marxism, conservatism, liberalism, uh, and now you have imperialism to add to that. The, uh, it's a major part of this period. So make sure that you know where the Europeans uh, really began to cast their net. It was in Africa, it was in China, it was in India, it was in Southeast Asia, okay, and other parts of the world as well. All right, that's it for this one, okay, and uh, until the next time.